Thanks very much. It's very good to be with you. Uh, and uh, looking at this particular um, taxing, uh, tricky and challenging topic uh, with you. Uh, I'm not sure necessarily that uh, I have immediate slick answers. You would probably be slightly suspicious uh, if I did claim to have that. Uh, but uh, uh, in order to get our time underway, let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the God of all wisdom and all compassion and all righteousness. And we pray, Father, as we think of these things and we think of you as the source of these things, that you guide us to think in ways about uh, these issues uh, that please you and further your kingdom and bless our fellow men and women. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, now, you'll see that I've given you an A3 handout, a mind map, uh, which... Uh, uh, I rather like these. Uh, not everybody does, but I'm afraid uh, I've uh, thought it would be good uh, simply to have this uh, as a way of, as it were, getting everything down uh, on one sheet of paper uh, that we can look at. The way to read this uh, is rather like a clock face, so we're going to be following it round in a clockwise uh, direction. Uh, and to get us underway, uh, let me talk, uh, and this is uh, round about sort of uh, one o'clock on the clock face, the first major arm, uh, let me talk about some of the presenting issues that have arisen really over the last 18 months to two years. First of all, there's been the whole question of high-profile cases, uh, of uh, some of the gender issues. Predominantly this afternoon, uh, we're going to be thinking about the presenting issue of transgender, I appreciate uh, that there are other gender issues at stake, but that, I think, is one of the sharpest just at the moment. Uh, and you'll see that the high-profile case that I refer to uh, is of the uh, person formerly known as Bruce Jenner, currently trading as Caitlyn Jenner, uh, ex-reality TV, ex-Olympic athlete, uh, currently, some would say, including me, a highly confused individual. But, of course, uh, uh, Bruce Jenner came out as Caitlyn Jenner, uh, sought medical treatment to ensure that uh, uh, he could be Caitlyn Jenner. Uh, and intriguingly, the way that this was presented in our, our media was that we all had to call Bruce Caitlyn. This was at the same time, you may recall, uh, that we had the remarkable cultural and, and uh, ethnic appropriation of Rachel Dolezal, who was uh, saying that she was black, uh, when from a technically descent point of view, she was anything but. What's the difference? What's the difference in terms of self-designation? Why is it okay for us to say, no, Rachel Dolezal isn't really black, when actually, at the same time, we're being told by some of the same social commentators in some of the same media that we have to call Caitlin, Caitlin? It's uh, a, an enormously puzzling set of issues. And really, over the last two years, we've seen that take off in all kinds of ways. So there's transgender issues uh, in the workplace, uh, where actually, as an employer, you find yourself thinking, what is it that I have to do uh, in order to be compliant with whatever government regulation it is, when one of my employees identifies as transgender? What happens at the water cooler uh, as a colleague when the same thing happens? When the person who you said farewell to on Friday evening uh, as Rachel comes back as Bill on Monday morning? There again, you may be a service provider, uh, at which point, how do you hack it uh, when someone asks for your services, for instance, in something really rather like the Ashes, ba uh, Ashes Bakery case? There again, uh, what about uh, 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 life as a, a, a client? How do you deal with someone? Are you going to walk out of an office on the grounds that you're not prepared to have a service provided by such and such a person because of the transgender issue? Similarly, there's transgender in the public square. Uh, obviously, one of the things that crosses my mind is what happens to me, what happens to my graduates uh, in the pulpit when they preach on this issue. It, frankly, uh, over the last 15 years, uh, has been increasingly difficult in some pulpits to preach anything at all on, on the same sex issue. Uh, what's it going to be like on transgender? There again, there's the, the blog that one writes, that uh, one puts up on, on the internet. Uh, suppose I was to put up a blog. 
saying, no, we should call Bruce Bruce, not Caitlin. There again, uh, there's the town hall, uh, that kind of environment. What do I say at a local government level? There's transgender, of course, in schools, uh, where as a parent you may find that uh, uh, the child of another set of parents has identified uh, as transgender uh, and that the school is bending over backwards, as happened to one of our graduates, uh, is bending over backwards uh, to ensure that uh, the single transgender child in a school of 200 is accommodated. How do I react as a governor of uh, uh, a state comprehensive school? where I find out this week that one of the children has come back from the summer holidays identifying as, uh, 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 as male when formerly she was female. What's it like for the teacher uh, in that kind of situation? Transgender, of course, in social settings. What happens when the transgender couple adopt a child and they invite you, Everyone invites you to uh, come to the party uh, or to sign the office card congratulating said couple. As happened to my wife earlier this month. There again, of course, says transgender in academic settings. Uh, what do we do as teachers in an academic setting? How do we react to a student who is uh, transgender or identifies as transgender? What do we write dare we research in any of these areas? And in all of this, of course, we're aware that part of the climate in which we operate in tertiary education, certainly, is that we are regarded as service providers who have due obligation under various bits of consumer legislation, Consumer Rights Act stuff. And provokingly, of course, there's the issue of change therapy. There are I was trying to think of something good that came out of uh, the Brexit uh, uh, debacle. I suppose we did get rid of David Cameron as Prime Minister, and that probably counts as a plus. But one of the things that Cameron uh, was on record as saying uh, was that he wanted to ensure that uh, uh, providers of change therapy on sexual orientation uh, should be, as far as possible, de-recognised and outlawed. Now, that's really quite intriguing, isn't it? That actually you're not even going to have that option in the marketplace of medical therapeutic care. Presenting issues. Uh, and the reason why I set it out like that is to make it clear that actually this is something coming from a whole range of different directions, striking our culture, our society, at a whole range of different levels, both socially, professionally, uh, and so on. It's not just uh, as academics that we may have to think about these things. There again, that takes us to the much more general question uh, of gender uh, in the world. Uh, and this is uh, three o'clock on, on, on the mind map. Here, I'd, I'd want again to point to the massive degrees of confusion that we're looking at. And one of the things that will affect how we react is the degree of confusion we face that, uh, uh, as C.S. Lewis memorably puts it in the first of the screw tape letters, uh, part, of the, part of the feature of, of modern Western culture is that educated people have a dozen completely inconsistent philosophies running around inside their heads. Which one do you address and how? What happens if you, as it were, engage the least helpful one rather than the most helpful one and so on? But yes, there is uh, confusion. Uh, I think it's intriguing, uh, going back to the, the, the attempt to deregister uh, marginalised alternative therapies, uh, that actually at the same time that that was happening, we had uh, uh, accounts of the kind of transgender surgical therapies that were being put forward, uh, which are really, when you think about it, very invasive and very violent, for want of a better word. What's the difference between that kind of therapy, which does, for want of a better word, such violence to an individual, as against uh, a, a change therapy? Why, why de-recognise one and recognise the other? It, it's intriguing. Uh, 
Uh, and I wonder, actually, if uh, uh, one of the things we'd want to look at uh, is that uh, the de-recognition of change therapy as practiced by, by some people, we recognise that it can be done badly, but let's think about it as a possibility, that one of the things about change therapy is that it involves an individual trying not to follow their desires. Whereas the intriguing thing about, in inverted commas, legitimate change therapy, or legitimate therapy where I change from one gender to another by surgery, or drugs, other, other means, that actually what is happening there is that I'm being allowed to enforce my desires. The place of human desire in all of this is an intriguing uh, issue. So confusion. Uh, what do we do with human desire? I think also, uh, as we approach this issue, uh, we have to recognise that our culture is confused as between the collective and the individual, collectivist and individualist. Uh, it's one of the remarkable things just at the moment, how collectivist uh, various strands of lawmaking in this country are. So think of the bill that's just uh, uh, got through the Lords uh, that uh, so remarkably extends government scrutiny uh, of uh, various bits of email communication and, uh, and so on. Uh, remarkably uh, kind of uh, surveillance, uh, for want of a better word. It's a remarkably panopticon look, if you can put it that way. How is it justified? Well, of course, public safety, public order. And this, please note, is so tempting. It's so tempting, not least for a government because it extends power, but of course it's so tempting for a, for a culture as a collective uh, because it offers some kind of control in an increasingly confused, confusing, volatile, ambiguous, changing world. But alongside that collectivist streak, there's a strongly individualist streak. Of course there is. People have often commented on the way that so much of our culture is increasingly therapeutic uh, in the way that it approaches things, uh, that we want to ensure that uh, we, we treat things as disease needing cure rather than guilt needing punishment, that kind of thing. This is also, of course, an entitlement culture in spades. Uh, can I commend to you, if you haven't come uh, across her already, uh, Jean M. Twangy. Um, one of the reasons why I cite Jean M. Twangy is because I cannot believe that a really good social psychologist has such a bizarre name, Twangy. Uh, but she's very, very good. Uh, and one of her points is that we're living in an entitlement culture. Uh, and we can measurably see the increase of entitlement narcissistic mentalities uh, over time. This is, of course, a consumption <coughs> culture. We're encouraged to produce for others to consume, and we're certainly encouraged to consume in various ways. Intriguingly, uh, I caught a news headline uh, in which one particular news anchor was saying approvingly how wonderful it was that post-Brexit, consumer spending didn't seem to have dropped off very much as if it was a, na a national virtue. Salvation by spending. And of course, that's tempting too. It's a different species of confusion from the collectivist confusion, but it's there all the same. And the difficulty, of course, is how do you marry that collectivist mindset with that individualist mindset? It's intriguing, again, to look at the aftermath uh, of the Trump-Clinton uh, election uh, and look at the way that actually people find it very difficult as individuals to accept the collective decision when it's so remarkably against them, apparently. You'd almost think that democracy isn't God. With that, next major point there's a huge question about who makes the individual. Who makes the individual? Is the in individual socially constructed uh, fundamentally? And if so, please note that there are going to be those who want to talk in terms of the uh, right inevitability or right and inevitability of the majority to construct its citizens. That's one, I think, of the big collectivist claims that's going on at the moment, certainly in terms of uh, the way that we shape future citizens in school, that it's the claim of the majority 
to determine by a social construction method what the future citizen is going to look like, what his or her values are going to be, who he or she will accept, and so on. That's one reason why social construction by what I've called here sectarian elements is so controversial. Again, think back over the last 18 months uh, to one of the big uh, kind of questions, which has been the out-of-school setting uh, controversy. Uh, Nikki Morgan, uh, when she was uh, in office, pushing through, arguing for a system of registration that would ultimately allow greater control of -of out-of-school settings. Why? So that, well, I suppose sectarian people like me uh, can't go around uh, and uh, fill a 17-year-old's head with evil thoughts uh, that are contrary to British values or or whatever the, the mantra happens to be. So what makes the individual? Is it social construction? Is it simply a question of individual sovereignty? Or is it something else? And if so, what else? There, of course, that is, uh, as the Doctor Who plotline would say, a spoiler uh, for what I'm going to say in a few minutes about creation. That moves us on in this uh, singularly pressing area area of gender to what I've called the Chas Bono thesis. Uh, Chas Bono being the uh, daughter, uh, or as she would say, son, uh, of uh, Bono, someone Bono and Cher. Sonny Bono? Sonny and Cher, thank you very much. Uh, Brad is, is on the money there, uh, but that, that's because he's, he's trendy uh, in a way that I'm not. Chas <laughs> uh, Bono, uh, Chastity Bono, uh, as she was uh, christened uh, when, when born, uh, again, has identified as a man uh, and summarises uh, her view of, uh, 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 of things really quite nicely when she says, gender is between your ears and not between your legs. It's a very pungent way of capturing so much of the current uh, gender uh, debate because, of course, what's happened there is that the vital move that's being made is that gender is not a question of biology. The trouble with biology is that it has this ugly kind of fixed aspect to it. You you have to do really quite extreme things to your biology. And even there, uh, you know, as people rightly say, uh, your chromosomes, uh, in a sense, betray you uh, about your gender origin. But by saying no, gender is not biology, it's up there. Uh, of course, everything changes because it stops being objective reality and it starts, if you like, being a subjective reality. It's a confused subjective reality uh, because, of course, as I say, well, my gender is what I will it to be, what's in my head, then there is that question of whether uh, I can will differently uh, or, or not. How far does my freedom of will go? And as I put it that way, we realise that that actually we are exploring such fundamental questions of anthropology, of what it is to be a human being. Gender's between my ears, not between my legs. What must my mind be like? What must my will be like for that to be true? And how far does it go? Not biology, but will. Very interesting move. That takes us uh, to the next issue under this general heading, which is the sovereignty of desire. Sovereignty of desire. Uh, One of the uh, kind of uh, guys, uh, uh, secular sociologists that I most like reading, uh, uh, most stimulating, uh, is Zygmunt Bauman. Uh, And again, why Zygmunt Bauman? Well, as with Jean M. Twangy, uh, it's the name. Zygmunt. With a name like Zygmunt, this guy must be an intellectual. <laughs> that's, the, that's the crude rationale. Uh, Bauman, former professor of sociology at Leeds, retired now, I think, uh, but uh, written extensively uh, about modern culture and what's being presented. And his main thesis is liquidity, as uh, I'm sure you probably know, liquidity. The idea that the individual is liquid. 
Intriguingly, at that point, he's making a sociological observation that builds on a philosophical observation, a philosophical argument launched in the middle of the last cent in the middle of the nineteenth century uh, by the left-wing Hegelian Max Stirner, circa eighteen fifty. Stirner writes his big book, *The Ego and Its Own*, very telling title, because it's saying that actually I own myself, and I am therefore my own creature and my own creator. The rest of you, you're there, if you like, in Stirner's universe uh, for, for my uh, edification and delight. Uh, and indeed, you may think that I'm there for yours. But the thing ultimately at the end of the day is that I am my own creator and I am my own creature. When I say I'm a self-made man, that is to be taken for Stirner very, very literally. And of course, what I am today, I can opt not to be tomorrow. I am a creature in a perpetual process of self-invention. I am, Bauman's term, ultimately liquid. Of course, if you have a liquid individual, what follows next, as Bauman points out, is that you have a liquid society where the individual constituents of it are, so to speak, in permanent melted flux towards each other. If you have a liquid society, Bauman sees this uh, partly as threat, partly as opportunity. You have a relational erosion, of course. Relational erosion. Because why should I make commitments when the you who I'm making the commitment to may be a different person tomorrow? Because you are in this process of perpetual self-invention. So, of course, I'm going to be commitment-phobic in various ways. I will find it difficult to entrust myself to you because I don't really know the you to whom I entrust myself. What's going to mark the liquid society? Well, says Bauman, anxiety. Anxiety, fearfulness about what you can't control. With so much change around you, one of the things you're going to want to do is to nail down at least some things. And you'll want to make sure that health and safety is duly catered for. And so on. So that in that way, paradoxically, the liquidity of individuals in society, on Bauman's argument, is actually going to produce an anxiety which in its turn is going to feed our appetite for bureaucracy and regulation. Isn't that ironic in various ways? Very, very astute. Very astute. Liquid individuals, the, the Bauman thesis. Uh, of course, others would say that, no, we're not liquid. We are fundamentally frozen, uh, and there's no change possible. Uh, this is who I am. Uh, and uh, again, we experience that uh, in the gender debate. There are those who say I can opt to be of a different gender. And there are those who say, well, I'm frozen in a different gender between my head uh, as compared to my biology. And there's no point in trying to change that. So my biology must follow my head. In both of those cases, please note, whether you're thinking about the individual as frozen or the individual as liquid, Actually, what's happening is that desire, human desire, is sovereign. Very starkly there in the kind of Bauman-Sterner uh, idea, but also in the frozen individual idea. Because, make no mistake, faced with biology and what's in my head, what's in my head, what I want to be, that's what wins on the frozen individual thing. It's just that I can't change what's inside my head. So sovereignty of desire. Gender uh, at the moment and transgender uh, is uh, the sharp end, uh, I think, of a much more general question, which is the identity question. Uh, who am I? Do I own myself? And with that comes an autonomy autocracy question. Autonomy autocracy. If you think about the etymology of the word autocrat, it means what? It means I rule myself. I rule myself. Autos Krator. I rule myself. Uh, under the Byzantine regime, uh, after the fall of the western part of the Roman Empire, one of the titles uh, for the uh, emperor in Byzantium and emperor in Constantinople was 
the autocrator, because he was the only one who was able to rule himself. And of course, at that point, he could only rule himself because no one else was autonomous. In order to make sure that he ruled and was not subject to anybody, everybody else had to submit. To be autonomous, I must be an autocrat in a very modern sense of the word. And that's part of the reason why some of us react really quite strongly to what I've called the water cooler conversation, where your fellow employee says, yes, it's perfectly true that I was Rachel on Friday at six o'clock. Now, however, at 9.20 on Monday morning, I am William. Call me William. It's intriguing, isn't it? Because we do experience that as impositional. Uh, because uh, uh, actually I'm, I'm not just being asked to recognise this person as a different person. They, they are saying I have to recognise them on their terms in various ways. There is something autocratic in the modern sense of the word uh, about that. Now, please note, uh, as, I, as I say that and as I think about the water cooler conversation, I'm not necessarily saying uh, that what we must be arguing for uh, is the idea that Rachel slash William comes up to me and says, call me William, uh, and I then uh, reply and say, well, I'm not going to call you William, I'm going to call you, uh, enter uh, a term of Donald Trump-style abuse. Uh, I'm not suggesting that. Uh, it is possible to abuse freedom of expression, of course, but it's intriguing that there is this impositional element to it. That takes us, uh, and this is sort of 5.30 on the mind map, to gender in the Bible. You spent a lot of time, I think, uh, already thinking about this. So let me just uh, remind you of some of the salient points. Yes, the Genesis 1-2 narrative does present us uh, with uh, a humanity that is created male and female. To that extent, gender is a pre-fall created category. It is, what's more, a category maintained post-fall in various ways. Uh, partly uh, because we'd want to say that the institution of marriage continues uh, and same-sex marriage is not recognised, uh, but actually seen as sinful. Uh, partly also uh, because uh, uh, it seems to me in 1 Corinthians 11, following Gordon Fee's uh, commentary on that chapter, one of the things that we, we find there... Uh, is that uh, I'm not meant to say I refuse to be the biological gender uh, that was given to me. I would want to emphasise, third point under this uh, general heading, that creation is a gift. God did not have to make me at all. He would have been there in eternity, eternally blessed. He could have made a universe... Uh, without MJOV being present. I find that incredible, of course. But nevertheless, he would be perfectly blessed without me. It's a very, very important point. Creation, therefore, my creation, <coughs> is something that I must experience and must recognise as gift. And the same for uh, everybody else, of course. Once I start saying that and say that my gender is part of that gift then actually I, I am deeply challenged about the way that we handle gender. Because the gift dimension is so readily tuned out in various parts of contemporary debate. It raises a much more general question, next point under this heading, about the importance of creation as a theological category. Why is it so important? And, you know, we're talking about it uh, wh why bother with it? Well, first and foremost, of course, because God is established as owner through creation. Think of Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. You suddenly realise the earth is the Lord's. That's the language of ownership. We are God's property because, Psalm 24, he made us. And at that point, I, I'm led to say that as his property, he said, this is the kind of property I want you to be. It is gift. I've given you this. 
but it is nevertheless me as belonging to him. And the idea, therefore, that I can dispose of my body in some kind of way, dispose of my biology in some kind of way, as if it was mine absolutely, that actually does nag away, that does undermine the whole idea of creation, including gender, as gift. What's more, God emerges in creation as a generous blesser. Gender's gift. And actually, at, at that point, <laughs> the tragedy uh, of, of some of the things that we're seeing in the transgender debate is therefore the rejection of the way that God has blessed someone. That is an absolute tragedy, isn't it? Uh, actually decoding that and thinking, how is it that our culture has rejected God's blessing in this gender area? Well, actually, in the gender area, it's getting the list is getting longer and longer, isn't it? Uh, the rejection of uh, monogamous marriage in favour of uh, uh, premarital heterosexual sex, uh, the rejection of heterosexual marriage, the rejection of the lifelong nature of marriage, uh, and now transgender uh, as well. Um, we have a bad record in our culture of rejecting God's blessings in this area. We really do. And the oddness, of course, is that uh, uh, that's a, a state of denial of an asymmetrical dependence uh, that we have on God. We exist by his will and are sustained by his will, Revelation 4.11. For us, that means existence. For him, that means he is owed glory. And uh, <laughs> the, 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 the difficulty with sidelining creation in the kind of way that we are seeing in the gender debate, uh, is that uh, its ramifications actually apply much further towards redemption as well. So here, uh, I'm talking about uh, what you might call an Athanasian perspective. Uh, Athanasius, in his big work on the Incarnation, would say, well, what's the thing about sin? Sin, in lots of ways, is an undoing of, de of creation. It is a de-creation. You see that very starkly in the way that God's ordered hierarchy uh, of himself, humanity, rest of creation is turned upside down in Genesis 3 as the serpent slash beast of the field instructs humanity who then defies God. The hierarchy is inverted in that kind of way. Sin decreates in various ways. Redemption, to that extent, argues Athanasius rightly, is restoring creation. It's more than that because we're adopted as children, but it is at least that. That actually the great thing about the Lord Jesus Christ is, amongst other things, that he is the second Adam. That creation is recapitulated in him as finally there is a human being who is what a human being should be. That means, of course, that uh, if you don't have a doctrine of creation, you are not going to understand, understand sin in all of its dimensions as decreation properly, and you're not going to get uh, what redemption's about either, because you're not going to see it as restoration of creation, and you're probably going to miss the point that only the creator can redeem. And you might well be led to think that you can do it yourself. Now, at that point, the reason why I've teased this out uh, is to make us see how gender, in the way that it impacts on our doctrine of creation, is unscrambling a whole load of things. Not immediately, I'm not saying that Chaz Bonner actually has these thoughts in her mind, his mind, uh, uh, about these things. But nevertheless, that's what's there. Gender playing, you can say, is anti-creation. It's decreation in that kind of way. Now, let me move at that point over to the left-hand side uh, of the clock face, to sort of 6.30 in freedom of speech. And you'll see that I've uh, put up there the European Convention of Human Rights, Article 10, uh, paragraphs 1 and 2. Everyone has the right to freedom of expression. Wonderful. Uh, you read paragraph 1 uh, and you think, oh gosh, uh, that's, uh, that's really nice. Uh, that, that sounds good, doesn't it? Uh, you know, everyone has freedom of expression. Presumably that would include Christians too. Uh, you'd have thought so. Uh, and then you come on to paragraph two. 
the exercise of these freedoms, since it carries with it duties and responsibilities, may be subject to restrictions. Uh, and that, of course, is going to be enormously significant. We'll come back to what those restrictions are, but please note at that point that the first thing we have to get on the table is that the freedom of expression under the European Convention is by no means absolute because of the impact of paragraph two. Very obvious point, but exceptionally important. Let me move on uh, at that stage to freedom in academia. Now, uh, for one reason or another, I had to go over the Durham University. Uh, anybody from Durham University here? Good. Um, uh, the presenting issue behind this uh, is that uh, uh, my college has been asked to join a, a set of awards run out of Durham. Uh, and uh, uh, I was compelled to write a letter pointing out that our trust deeds say that scripture is to be supreme. Uh, and therefore, if someone in, for instance, a pastoral uh, exercise says, I know what scripture says, but I'm going to say something else entirely, uh, in pastoral practice, then we will mark such a student down. So I explained this to uh, Durham, and the immediate response is, oh, that's denying academic freedom. Very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, which, of course, then means that one starts crawling over the Durham uh, website to find out what they think academic freedom actually is. Uh, and uh, what's written there, I think, in lots of ways, is sort of fairly representative. What's written there is that, of course, you can restrain uh, academic freedom and freedom of expression on campus or in lectures or elsewhere for the sake of protection. It's what one might call the protection criterion. Protecting whom? Well, it's interestingly open-ended. Protecting from what? Well, that again starts to be interestingly open-ended. Um, one of the things that secular commentators are, are commenting on at the moment uh, is that uh, there is a difference between protecting someone from, uh, as it were, acts of aggression, genuine acts of racist aggression, for instance, and protecting someone from being offended. It's an interesting difference because it's one of those things where you think, yeah, of course there's a difference between, uh, you know, the legitimate statement of uh, uh, something that is, is striking uh, but may be offensive uh, to, to some people because some people get offended by anything uh, and uh, actually the, the, the idea that one may overstep the freedom of expression, uh, 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 freedom, uh, in the way that one, uh, as, uh, as it were, is... Uh, gratuitously offensive or putting someone in fear or, or, or whatever. But that is such, uh, I would say, a grey area. Absolutely. We want to protect. We recognise that protection is a criterion. But we're not quite sure what we're protecting people from. Of course we're not quite sure what we're protecting people from because we're not quite sure what people are. That's the issue. I'm not quite sure what a person is. So, am I free to say that Caitlyn Jenner is really Bruce Jenner? <sighs> the chattering classes, I think, would probably say not. Can I say that Rachel Dolezal is not really black? Yeah, I think I can get away with that. Rachel Dolezal is probably going to find me equally offensive as Bruce Jenner is. So what's the difference? What's the difference? We're not going to get regular predictable results precisely because the premises on which all of this rests are so confused. Of course that's right. That means uh, that uh, uh, we, we need now, having sort of briefly looked at the ECHR, Freedom of, uh, in, in Academia, and uh, uh, which is cast in some ways in remarkably similar terms to, uh, to the ECHR, very understandably, uh, to what the Bible says about the way that we should speak. Uh, and let me point out that uh, <laughs> the interesting thing about freedom of expression is that we tend to put freedom of expression in terms of right, don't we? But actually, when we examine biblical material about speech, very frequently it's put in terms of duty. 
rather more. I have a duty to love God, praise him for who he is, as creator and redeemer. That's how I'm meant to use my lips with respect to God. Similarly, I have a duty to love God and love my neighbour uh, by not bearing false witness, by not cursing my neighbour, by proclaiming what God wants proclaimed, by speaking graciously, and by appropriate submission to the state. All of those are ways in which I love God and I give honour where honour is due. Romans 13. That includes speech, clearly. And yet you've got Daniel 6 and, of course, Acts 4.19, which make it absolutely clear, Acts 4.19 in particular, that when we have been called on to speak and speak the name of Jesus, we must not be silenced. And Daniel 6, of course, uh, is an indication of a man who is disobedient, and rightly so, and is blessed by God for it. Those are very, very striking things. Now, bear in mind that we're dealing with a collectivist mindset that really, really, really is worried about public order and public safety. How does what I've just said about Acts 4.19 and Daniel 6 play in that mindset? When Theresa May was Home Secretary, how would she have reacted to what I've just said? She'd be worried, wouldn't she? She'd say this is nonviolent extremism. It it does follow, doesn't it? Uh, and, and at that point, uh, I'm afraid th there's no two ways about it. That what we have uh, is a set of biblical values which put God first and sees the state as subordinate to Him in various ways, uh, and a state which thinks that it's entitled to do whatever it wants for the sake of public safety and public order. Uh, and those values will clash. I don't think there's much doubt about it. I think they already are, uh, in various ways. This brings me uh, to the kind of next major, uh, as it were, intellectual category. We're now at sort of 10.30 on, on the mind map, the rule of law. The reason why I wanted to, to look at this is because I think it's such a singularly important thing that uh, we've been talking about, uh, latent in what we've been talking about. Why so? I've been stressing the ideas of confusion that actually underlie the system of values or the several systems of values uh, that our culture has. The rule of law, well, the purpose of the rule of law uh, is to ensure that the citizen knows his or her liabilities and can organise his or her business in advance. That's one of the big things, isn't it? Uh, that's the way that the rule of law has frequently been discussed in, in, in this country uh, for 150 years. The rule of law, of course, is not the only legal virtue that there is in a legal system, but it's a pretty critical one. But actually, I know as I drive home this evening, uh, and I drive at 70 miles an hour on the motorway, that the old bill is not going to pull me over uh, and find me 50 quid on the spot, uh, because they've suddenly decided that the speed limit uh, is 30 on the A1 open bracket M close bracket. Now, that means that the rule of law really is significant for the average citizen. And yet, one of the things that we're looking at here is the enormous degree of uncertainty for all of us, not just academics who think, but people who send their kids to Sunday school and so on, uh, an enormous degree of uncertainty, partly because the ECHR, the European Convention, in its very preamble, has a certain amount of opacity about what its fundamental basis is and why. But also, of course, even within paragraph two of Article 10, key concepts are just, for want of a better word, vague. They really are. So there's a protection criterion, but what is public safety? What, what does that mean, public safety? Health and morals. Whose morals? Reputation and rights of others. Well, actually, if I call Bruce Jenner Caitlin or Caitlin Bruce, have I diminished Bruce's reputation? These are enormously vague things. 
And of course, there's the uncertainty about whether or not the European Convention will endure. And come to that, there's an uncertainty uh, arising from the delay in the way that uh, my appeals to the European Convention are going to be applied. Think of me running a transgender evening uh, at my local church in which I say I'm going to be talking about it and uh, transgender people complain to the police saying that, uh, you know, this is hate speak and citing people to violence and all the rest of it. And the old bill comes along uh, and says, we've had several complaints, we'd like you not to do it. Now, at that point, what do I do? What do I do? Um, I say, well, you know, what about Article Article uh, 10, Paragraph 1 of the European Convention? Uh, and uh, uh, I, I may well receive a dusty answer uh, from the average copper. What do I do then? Well, uh, my church wardens uh, will tell me, actually, let this one just go and we'll sort it out tomorrow when we've had a chance to ring a solicitor. And I will have lost the opportunity. And uh, then there'll be the letter uh, that says, yes, well, you know, perhaps we did overreact a little bit, not without accepting any liability, but there you are. Why didn't you hold another meeting? And I think, well, maybe the same thing would happen. The nature of some of these uh, human rights things is that the, there is a delay between the moment I need it and the moment where I can get declaration. Uh, we sometimes talk about the way that uh, our culture is becoming juridified in various ways. That's to say that there's a massive growth in, in regulation in all kinds of in all kinds of respects, uh, and here I'd say that uh, juridification is one thing to have lots and lots of laws if they're nice and clear and well thought through, but the kinds of laws we actually have, increasingly, are ones which put an enormous stress on executive enforcement, in which the executive ends up writing the policy. This is how this rule is going to work. And where actually the executive makes judgments, we will issue this order saying you can't meet. If you want a kind of classical appreciation of it, uh, Montesquieu, the great uh, uh, French political thinker, uh, would be turning in his grave because he'd say that uh, actually both the legislature and the judiciary in various ways have lost their hold on the executive, which is encroached on what they probably do. Last thing, just as we finished, what's at stake? I've gone through all of this and it seems to me that uh, uh, in terms of where we go from here and what we need to be thinking about, uh, yes, of course, we need to be thinking theologically first and foremost. God comes first. But let me distinguish between what you might call the presenting issue of what I say at the water cooler when Rachel says, call me William, what I, I, I say there in that kind of presenting issue and the underlying issue of which Rachel slash William is almost entirely unaware, the underlying theological issue is creation. Creation impacting redemption and redemption which involves repentance. Now, if I'm thinking things through, then uh, whatever I say at the water cooler, my long-term aim has to be how am I going to uphold a biblical account of creation? What is going to be the way by which I can best do this? I was very struck by the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Tasmania, who is completely conservative uh, on the transgender issue, actually saying precisely that he would call Rachel William, uh, and he was prepared to call the person who had accused him of hate crime, according to the gender that they'd selected, because he thought that was the best way in which he slash she could hear the truth about the gospel and the truth about creation. I was very challenged by that. Because, of course, what he was saying is we have to keep an eye on the underlying critical theological issue. And how do we do that? And how we do that? What's at stake, secondly, in terms of what we need to think through? We need to think through protection. What protection is William entitled to, do we think as Christians, at the water cooler? I may want to call William Rachel. When somebody else comes along and calls them a pervert who ought to be hanged, do I think that's free expression too? 
what protection do I think they are entitled to in various ways, and why? Next, of course, in terms of what we're arguing, yes, we, we need to get back to a proper appreciation of the rule of law. Because one of the things we're noticing here is that, actually, we're no longer really clear what any of our rights and liabilities are. Now, I think I've been sufficiently provoking. Uh, I'm going to pause there uh, and hand over to hand over to Chris.